Live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. We're back, this is The Cube, and we're at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Cube is Silicon Angle's live production of MIT IQ, the Information Quality and Chief Data Officer Symposium. We're pleased to have Laura Hahn here. She's a senior data governance consultant at TD Ameritrade. Laura, welcome to theCUBE, good to have you. Thank you. So we've been talking about the panel that you moderated today. I mm -hmm. uh, want to get into that, uh, but before we do, what does a senior data governance consultant at TD Ameritrade do? Well, I actually have a, a recent update to that. I'm actually the senior manager of enterprise data governance. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Come to theCUBE, get promoted. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Cause and effect. Uh, so I've, I've assumed the leadership for, for enterprise data governance at TDA. Um, and so we, but I work also with uh, metadata, reference master data, and data quality, and just making sure we're effectively utilizing all those tools. So. Uh, Working on rolling out enterprise data governance. Metadata went mainstream a couple years ago <laughs> with the whole you know, Snowden reveal. Mm -hmm. People really didn't think about it outside of our industry, but right. I, I have, uh, is there going to be more, more metadata than data someday? <laughs> when you actually look at the academic definitions and all the different components of metadata, it does become really, really huge. Yeah, yeah absolutely, and I think you have to determine what you're going to go after to make it more manageable. What do you mean? To uh, unpack that a little bit. Well, it, you know, I think um, once once you once you start to look at all the different types of metadata that are out there and all the things you could capture and start to document, um, it becomes really really big, and and you can feel like you're spread thin, mm. you know, a mile wide and an inch deep. And I think you you know it, we have to start thinking about what what parts of what metadata uh, can we capture that's the most valuable to our firm right now uh, to try to. Uh, start creating that repository of valuable metadata, because um, going after everything might not be a great use of your time. Um, so, you know, maybe it's critical data elements, maybe it's just, maybe it's lineage and uh, figuring out where the data is, um, but you can get into business process metadata, technical metadata. You know, we've had people internally at our firm approach us about several different things and, you know, and we've had to kind of pick and choose uh, where we're going to devote our resources first. One of the themes that we've been exploring at this event and the Cube, and, and certainly in previous years, is the the balance between data as a as an asset and data as a liability. Mm. Where do you spend your time? Um, you know, financial services. You could be targeting customers. You mm -hmm. could be dealing with fraud. You could be looking at new ways to, you know, get competitive advantage. Uh, you could be protecting your corporation. Where do you? How do you sort of slice that pie? I'd say I'm definitely on the data as an asset side mm -hmm. uh, and making sure we're getting all of the value out of it. I think there's so much more to do in that space. Um, you know, Certainly there's steps that we have to take to protect our data so that we're not exposed to certain amounts of risk, but uh, I think that the benefits far outweigh um, the, the liability side. We just have to be responsible citizens with our data. So definitely focused on, on the value. So your panel mm -hmm. earlier t today, maybe talk about that. It was the, sort of the pulse of the CDO, right? It was, uh, in creating actionable knowledge, which is, in my view, is really the win of the CDO office, is if you can take all of that raw data and convert it into something um, actionable and, and serving that back to the business and um, getting results. So we had, we had um, a few different topics. We spent a little bit more time on data governance than I expected, um, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, but you know, it seems that different companies are figuring out what it means in their firms or their companies to own data. What does that accountability structure look like? Um, who's the decision maker? How do you identify them? How do you acclimate them to that role? Um, you know, and there's a lot of different strategies, but ultimately, I think we discussed that the CDO does a lot of influencing, a lot of communicating, and a lot of educating to get the rest of the company to understand the part they play um, in, in being an owner and a steward. Uh, one, one of the issues that came up is who owns the data, mm -hmm. and uh, in the case of a medical uh, of a healthcare company, uh, your pan the panelist uh, strongly believes that the, that the customer owns the data. On the other hand, a retail company might not be so inclined uh, because there are things that they want to do with the data. In, in, 
how, how do we resolve this issue? Is this an industry by industry issue that needs to be addressed? I, I would suspect, I'm a big proponent of, of paying attention to culture and organizational change management. So I really think it, it could be a company by company um, difference. Uh, I think you have to figure out who the influencers and key decision makers are in your organization along whatever lines they fall. Um, and, and leveraging that existing culture to get the most effective decision making. Um, and, and it may end up being similar across an industry, but um, I, I think trying to go against your organization's culture is, is ultimately going to make it very hard to identify ownership. But, but don't, don't all organizations now need to be data and analytics oriented? I mean, mm -hmm. can you really be competitive if you don't do that? No, I mean, I absolutely think you have to, but I think um, you also find some surprising allies, and those are the people to align with. You know, um, there will be people who, who get it immediately, and they are raising their hand, and they're signing up to be accountable. They want to be accountable because they see the value, and I think um, even if it maybe isn't the model you originally wanted to deploy, I think you have to bring those allies in and, and work with them and find those opportunistic um, things that you can work on with them. So in that case, isn't the CDO more of a uh, an evangelist than mm -hmm. uh, than a practitioner? That'd be a great way to put it. Yeah. But that's not the case in in all areas. Uh, you, you see that that the that uh, the CDO in your in what you're seeing is becoming a very diverse set of skills. At, for a CDO to have uh, that, that, depending on the company, the CDO role may be compl completely different. Yeah, it's, and it's interesting. Is one of the questions I asked today was you know for for a next generation of of uh, talent aspiring to be a CDO, what, what are the skills you need to have? And I, you know, speaking with a gentleman about people coming from the business into that role, people coming from IT into that role, and I think it is such a diverse set of skills. And I, I have a finance and accounting background, and, and I think we need to be open-minded and, and really look at the leadership qualities, um, because ultimately I think that's what they spend the most time on, is influencing that senior leader peer group. So CDO is evangelist. Let's let's key on that for a second. So, mm -hmm. and, and I know there's a di di diverse set of examples, but let's just take that one example. If in fact he or she is the evangelist of the organization, and the organi and their their job essentially is to create awareness and you know catalyze action, and they succeed, they're pretty much out of a job, right? Is that <laughs> fair, or where do you see that that role long term going? Well, I I, I would place my bet on change. I, the, the changing economy, a changing industry, or a changing, you know, leaders move on too. The, the peer group changes over. So I, I really, I really think the, the job will never be done. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I think there's always competing priorities, and, and and I don't see it ever going away. That you have to continue to advocate for it, lest it get trumped by something else. Well, you you hosted a panel. And there was no agreement on. <laughs> On this uh, yeah, it was about what the future of the CDO role, and I think we, we had trouble to even defining what the present uh, state mm -hmm. of the CDO uh, role is, and, and that goes back to your panel. I, I sensed some frustration on your panel with CDO not really being able to get to that bigger strategic role, the analytic, the potential of mm -hmm. analytics. A lot of them still down in the weeds dealing with governance issues. Uh, do you sense that same frustration, or is that simply part of the job? The frustration that they're not getting to the analytics that side? They're having trouble getting to that next level where they're really providing strategic value to the business. And a lot of what CDOs are doing today is just finding data, normalizing it, fixing quality problems, categorizing, creating metadata, really kind of plumbing stuff. Um, is that just a natural state of the of the business right now, given the quality of data that's out there? I, I think so. I think there's a lot of heavy lifting uh, to do in the data. Um, this is something I, I've seen several times. There's there's a certain amount of hard work that you have to invest in correcting your data and getting it to a, a place where it's usable. And there's really, I think there's some people coming up with ways around that or you know, looking at ways to innovate around that. But I think for the most part, most of us just see that there's a lot of hard work that maybe an organization has avoided for a long time. and you're left with no other choice but to just dive in and start doing it. And so, if that's the case, then then yes, a lot of CDOs are going to be busy with that because that's really, it's the foundation of the house on which if you try to build analytics, you're eventually going to have less valuable analytics because you question the quality of the data.
I, I don't want to put you on the spot as far as, I don't want you to name names about employers, but you, you went from, you, you've been in two very different industries. You were mm -hmm. at Target, which is an acknowledged leader in, in analytics and, and customer profiling. You've gone to a very heavily regulated business now with, with Ameritrade. What have you found there is in any difference culturally to how data, is, how, how people look at data? Well, I think um, one, of the, one of the dimensions that's definitely different is, is time and speed. So the, the, the industries have a different time component. So retail, retail customers shop you know, every half hour or every hour, or they're buying something every day. And so the, the cycle to deliver insights in retail is extremely fast because a customer can leave very quickly. In something like financial services, that customer has an account with you and they've probably in, intended to have that relationship for a while. So the, 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 time, the time component and your risk of losing that customer is longer. So um, that's the main thing I've seen is the, the, the pressure that we as, as data management professionals are under to deliver that information, the cycle time is diff definitely different. Uh, how does that affect the way you use data? Uh, it Target it is obviously offers, coupons, promotions, the timing is, is very mm -hmm. important. Ameritrade, you don't, you're not under that same kind of pressure, but they still use data strategically, don't they? Yes, we definitely do, but I would say um, the, in terms of uh, something like data quality and figuring out what your data quality capability needs to be, you can you would adjust that depending on what that demand is for data to be accurate. So, you know, in one scenario, I would be getting phone calls at six in the morning because the reports from the prior day were, were off. It was that fast, whereas, you know, in a, in a slower moving environment, I think that demand for data quality, there, there's more tolerance. Um, and it can take a little bit longer um, before the business is really demanding something like a data quality fix. So, you just there's a little bit different priorities. Well, and there's a lot of obviously real time aspects of financial services, particularly in trading. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but when we, we, we when we talk about real time, we, we define real time as before you lose the customer. Right. And so in retail. <laughs> That's but in retail, way. you're giving me a, you're giving me an incentive to come into the store and buy something. If you do that in trading, it's illegal. You're going <laughs> to jail, right? <laughs> right. But at the same time, you know, every every customer action interaction in retail is a, is a new transaction. It's a whole and complete order. You know, in in financial services, they have an account, and it's a sub transaction of that account. So you may not lose the relationship. Um, on on the basis of one trade. Now you don't want that to be sustained over time. You want to you want to shore that up. Um, but on on the retail side, you know that customer may never come back again. They don't have a standing account with with assets in it. You know every every sale is an opportunity to win or lose them. So it's, they're just, they're both valid. They're just different cycles. Your financial background is that the perfect fit for the role you're in? Are there are there Things that you wished you had, you know, studied or brought in for people out there that are interested in this type of role. That's that's a great question. I, one thing I I I appreciate about it is that I understand a PNL, and I it's, it would be my wish for everyone in an organization to have a, a great understanding of a PNL and what it takes to manage that because it really helps me understand what the business is, cares about because they're probably held accountable to some financial. Um, financial number and I can better align what we're doing in data management to to those goals um, something I wish I had was more of, of the technical skills um, you know I've had to learn um, by osmosis and just jumping in uh, a lot of the technical terminology and being on different um, uh, IT projects uh, I've had to pick that up along the way uh, so that's something I definitely wish I had more of. So that's more parlance, really, exposure to technologies and what people mean by it. There's a gazillion. I wish I had more exposure to that, too, when I've been at this almost 30 years. So <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> yeah. no, uh, what engineering. about statistical capabilities, you know? I, I think, yes, now I would say so. So With there's more of a, I mean, we always say, you know, what's the perfect mix of for data science, it's math, mm -hmm. it's programming, statistics, you know, data hacking, I would think that the more stats you know, the easier it is to communicate with a lot of the folks that are in the organization. That Absolutely, and, and I think it depends, you know, if I were giving someone advice, it would depend on what level they were at in the organization and, and where they aspired to be. 
you know, I would say you get to a point where uh, as long as you can interpret the statistics, so there's a difference between producing the statistics and interpreting them and telling the story of them. So, um, you know, I, I, I think someone would need to take a look at where they're at and where they want to get to. Um, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm really working on interpreting and telling the story. Um, but you want to make sure you can also build a team around you then that can produce and, and actually work with the math. There's a lot of talk about this concept of the citizen data scientist, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the failings of the business intelligence, you know, initiatives over the last decade or so has been the inability to put those insights into the hands of business us users fast enough. <coughs> you have to go mm -hmm. through a big process and it's complicated, it takes forever, so we're talking about citizen data science now. Does that scare you as a governance professional or is that an attractive proposition? And when you say citizen, do you mean just that no, anyone can do as it? In, you know, business users and you know, folks that are not trained necessarily in data science, but are people, everyday salespeople, marketing people. You know. Yeah, I, th I think it, honestly, it scares me a little. And I, it probably comes from my experience managing uh, KPI uh, reporting, because it becomes, if not managed well over time, you can end up with multiple versions of the story about uh, your company's performance and that's eventually going to have to be rationalized so that everybody's on the same page making sure someone if someone's saying business is up you don't have another person saying business is down because that affects your decision making so i, th I think it has to be uh, managed a little bit uh, and not you can't let it get too out of control otherwise you will eventually start uh, seeing various uh, tentacles of decision making that don't always align and then you're going to have to do the hard work of aligning them again. That's why governance is important. You, you, you were a speaker last year at this conference on a topic related to privacy. What, what aspect of privacy do you address specifically? Uh, I was talking about, um, it was big data and privacy and the element I wanted to add was the human behavior element and it was based on some experience I had with web and browse data and working with uh, Hadoop environments and uh, kind of going back to your citizen data science, we had a lot of people who were really interested in data and we're starting to move it around. And I think um, you have to be careful uh, because the opportunities to, to leak data are, are you, you always think it'll never be you. You know, oh, I'm not in that type of a role. It'll never happen to me. But a surprising number of teams I think are, are in that position to maybe share data where they need to be more careful about sharing data. Uh, to where I think we need more education and we need stronger stewardship out there amongst those groups so that people are more aware when they're asked to share data that they know the right procedures. Um, and it's that, 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 tug, uh, that, that, that tug of war we've been talking about in terms of access versus security. Um, people want the data, they want access, they want, they want to um, bring together pieces of data or maybe work with a third party but we've got to think through, and, and notice I'm not, I'm not saying no, it's not that we can never share data with a third party, but we have to be a lot more thoughtful. Um, and, and I'm not you know, speaking about any company in particular, but you think it's not going to happen to you, but then you're asked, and you have to know when to stop and think and know who to call and make sure it's okay. I, I, I'm not going to put you on, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, the, but you were at Target during a very important event related to article in the New York Times regarding uh, Target's use of data to target uh, promotions to a, an expected mother whose family didn't know she was expecting. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was, many people including me thought that reflected very well on Target, uh, just technically what they were <laughs> able to do, but certainly there was also a countervailing privacy issue there. What did we learn from that incident? Or was there anything, you're looking back at that incident, uh, what what changed or, or how did your own perspectives on privacy perhaps were affected by that? Right, it's, it's a great question. I, I think um, it was the first time it became more widely acknowledged that personalization was happening. Um, I, I, know, I, I know I had several conversations with friends and family about um, the fact that personalization has been happening for a while and that as long as it's within our, our personal guardrails we, we accept it and we leverage it and we use it, um, but once it crossed a line, we, I think we all realized that there's, there's a point of taking it 
to to a level where it, it can make people uncomfortable. And uh, so, you know, I think there's I've I've seen studies quoted since then on how many points of personalization are acceptable to a consumer and beyond that it does start to feel uncomfortable. And so companies I think are more mindful of you know how how personal to get. But how do you determine those guardrails? I mean, is, isn't that unique to the individual? Uh, I, I think it can be, but you know, I, I'm sure they they do um, you know focus groups and things like that. And and it, it's interesting. I, I'd love to continue to watch it because um, there's there's also been a lot uh, published recently on choice and when consumers ultimately have too much choice or too much noise, and it becomes difficult to find things, um, especially in the retail space, you have to make it easy for them. So you're trying to balance making it easy um, with still letting the consumer have choice. And so that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's tough. It'll be interesting to see how companies answer that as they get more and more customer information. I think it's Malcolm Gladwell that said, when he goes to the supermarket and there are 50 different kinds of salad dressing on the shelves, his reaction is not to buy salad dressing. <laughs> I, I know the feeling, you'll stand there sometimes, you just walk away. Say, yeah, I, can, I, I can't right. do this. Like I have four year old kids, I've learned that you, you, don't, you don't give them three items on their plate because they can't process <laughs> that, even two at most. Right, and, and uh, uh, there, the studies say things like when there's when there's too much choice, people are actually unhappier. And right. the fewer choices there are, the happier they are because they're more satisfied. So how does that play into the role of the CDO? Because the natural tendency of the business side is to give people test a lot of things, give people a lot of choice, but but maybe the the the, the, the data officer should be responsible for advocating for the customer. No, you're you're going to have exactly the the opposite effect. Yeah, well, I, I think it's ultimately the responsibility of, um, you know, if, if it's, you know, the people de deciding on the products or the people deciding on the user experience of the website or, um, you know, it's really up to the business, I believe. Um, but those might be some questions that a, that a CDO asks just to maybe pressure test the ideas and and figure out, um, you know, do we, do we really need this data or that data, but uh, you know, I've ultimately the CDO's job is to connect the, the data supply to the data demand, and it's up to the business. How do you avoid being in that position of saying no? Um, which I think was a, a brush that a lot of CIOs were tarred, tarred with. Uh, they were not enabling the business, they were, they were too busy guarding things to, to enable the business. How do you avoid getting into that same vicious cycle as a CDO? Well, no, that's a, that's a great question. It's an impossible um, question to answer. Too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know I've, I've been in that position of saying no when people ask for data, and um, I, th I think you have to follow it up with. Uh, I call them seek to understand conversations. Uh, seek to understand what they're really asking for. What are they trying to do? Um, I've had a lot of those. People would come to me and say, "I need this data," and and. I would say, well, especially when I was, was was doing more reporting in BI, and they would just ask me for the data. A lot of it was just educating them and making them aware of other tools. I can give you more than just raw data. Maybe all you really need is one metric, mm. and you don't need the raw data. So let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about how we get you the metric or the trend line you're interested in, and then you're not necessarily pulling raw data out and putting it out there. So. I think it's just seeking to understand what are they really trying to do, and then sharing more with them about how you can help them with that problem, instead of saying no to the initial request. So, get, go ahead, Dave. Well, follow up, please. I, well, I, I was going to say, I mean, so you really, you're really talking at the level of the business. Then you have to be smart about what the business, how the business operates, and you mm -hmm. have to be seen as an ally on the business side. Right, and that's where, for, for example, for me, that financial acumen has been so helpful. So if I can, un if I understand someone's trying to manage, you know, a, a shipping expense line on the P&L, I, I know exactly what they're trying to do, and I can maybe already guess what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Or if they're trying to manage uh, net new assets or something like that, I know where they're going. So let's talk about where they're going. Well, so and that ties into the concept of the citizen data scientist. So a business user might just want that killer chart the trend line. And so if you can give her or him visualization tools on a corpus of data and allow them to 
you know, create charts easily and mix and match things and train them a little bit on how to do that, that is going to more than suffice oftentimes. Right, right. And it depends on how an organi organization is set up. Some, some organizations have centralized business intelligence functions. Some have federated. And so, you know, it's about having the right, um, I think, really good relationships with whoever those people are and understanding their capabilities and when they want to roam free and work on their own and, and when maybe they're getting into something else that's beyond their expertise and they need more of that, that COE um, help because they're now pursuing something a little more sophisticated and just providing them whatever help aligns with what they're trying to do. COE, Center of Excellence, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're making a, a bit of a career out of data governance. Where does that career lead? Uh, for anyone in data governance, or for me, or? Well, I, no, for any, I'm asking you to speak generally. You want a job, we think you're great in the queue. Yeah. We'd love to have you. <laughs> it's great to be here. For, uh, at the panel I just did, I did one of the, this is one of the issues that came up, is where does the, where does a CDO job lead to? Is this a CEO track? Um, or, it is, or is it a dead end? I, I mean, do, where do you see your career in data governance going? Well, it's my, my personal opinion. I, I, think, I think data governance, one of the things I love about data management, I would say data governance leads into data management, uh, provided you can um, have sufficient experience with both the business and the technical components. Um, I love it because I get to see all the components of the business. I get to see the P&L lines, I get to see the revenue side, the expense side, operations, sales, um, HR and payroll. I mean, you can, you can learn so much because you have to understand all the data. You have to understand all the parts of your company. And so I think there's great opportunity to to focus on one of those that you find that you really enjoy and move into that. I, I, I don't know that a, I would say a CDO is a straight to CEO move unless a, that CDO had spent some time in a couple of other pyramids uh, within the firm. But, but, it, but it certainly could lead to a strategy role too. I mean, what you just described is a perfect, you know, strand in, in the, the chief strategy officer is making a comeback, right? Mm -hmm. With all these mm -hmm. disruptions that are going on. So, right, it used to be strategy. If you had strategy in your title, you were dead. <laughs> right. Uh, right. But now, strategy, you know, can create, you know, Ubers and <laughs> Airbnbs. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. Awesome. So in your new role, what kind of what things do you want to get accomplished in the next 12 months? What do you, what are your objectives? Well, we're uh, you know, we're data governance takes time to implement and I'd say we're still in in the nascent stages. So, you know, we're in the mode of educating and uh, doing initial uh, pilots on different things and really demonstrating the capabilities and and um, building on some initial momentum to work towards that tipping point where data governance is pretty widely accepted. So, um, you know, we're firing on all cylinders, um, but trying to really hone in the projects we work on with uh, current strategic priorities set by the CEO and by our leadership, so. What, what kind of, of outcomes do you look for when you're doing these pilot projects? What kind of outcomes uh, uh, do you aim for? Sort of short-term uh, uh, short proof of concept or, or the longer term? Um, I'd say they're, they're shorter term proof of concept. Um, although we want them to align with longer term goals. So um, so for us in TD Ameritrade, um, obviously we're in a regulatory environment, so you know we have a couple of things that we're working on there uh, to support the compliance team with some things that they're interested in. Um, but you know, we also have a large operations function because we, we clear trades and um, we have a big very well-oiled operations machine, and their bread and butter is efficiency. So mm. we think there's some ways we can look into the data and, and help them save time, save manual effort. Um, so those those are definitely two. And then um, I think everybody's always focused on the client experience and, and looking at ways we can support a, a clean and, and positive client experience, and teams were focused on that. So those are probably the big three uh, that right. we... We have to leave it there. Laura Hahn, thanks very Great. much for coming to theCUBE. Congratulations on the new role and uh, really appreciate your insights. Thank you so much. It's right, good you're to welcome. Be here. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Paul and I will be back with our next guest, and to wrap, day two MIT Information Quality Symposium. We're right back. <laughs>